Okay, so hello everyone again. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, welcome to um, our third and last session of this workshop. Um, so I know the assignments for last week um, may have been a bit hard uh, for everyone to accomplish, um, but I still hope you had some success or at least you managed to um, follow um, my video afterwards. Um, if you have encountered any particular issues which are not covered in the video or so, um, yeah, please use the chance to ask now maybe. So were there any particular issues you encountered and you could not solve yourself? Nobody? Okay. Then let's start <laughs> with uh, today's session. Uh, let me share my screen. and switch to presentation. OK, so <clears throat> if you did all the assignments um, by now, we already have a rather nice page with a facsimile view and the metadata sidebar and uh, the main text in the middle. And now, for sure, the next step would be to not be limited to um, the TI publisher environment, uh, where you only have the playground um, to, to list your files, but to be able to actually generate a custom website um, for your ed edition. So this will be the second topic and the new topic today. Um, but before that, we will speak a little bit more about web components just to make sure um, that you understand the, the bigger picture. So there have been some questions about uh, all the different components um, you can have on a page and where they are documented and things like that. So we will first look into this. Um, yeah, then we will actually generate a custom website for our Dodis edition. And uh, finally, we will have a look at how we can tweak the design. So change the logo, change the colors. Um, yeah, change a little bit here and there, the typography, other things. Um, so at the end of this workshop, you should have at least an idea of all the different areas where you can change things um, to apply the learned uh, to your own edition. So let's start with the third topic, uh, fir first topic, sorry, um, web components. Um, I already showed you um, this slide last week. Uh, so what, what you see here is um, the intro to the, to the TI Publisher documentation. And um, within that slide, I marked up all the different web components which are being used here. Um, those are not even all web components because there are little bits and pieces um, everywhere. So even the menu does contain web components and I have not marked this up here, but you see the, the most important web components. So you already know that PB view is like the central component if you want to display um, XML rendered via ODD and processing model, then you use PB view. Um, PB navigate we use for navigating between um, divisions or pages. Then we have PB load uh, for loading the table of contents. We have PB zoom for the zoom buttons. We have PB search, which provides this input field up there where you can search for something. 
Uh, PBLang does change the user interface language. PB login is for uh, presents you with this login dialog and so on. Um, so on one page, there are many little web components which together form this this page. Um, <clears throat> so and just to uh, deepen our understanding a bit, how. Uh, is such a page actually built up? So it, on on a timeline, what's what's happening? So first of all, um, we have the exist database to the left, which contains all the necessary materials. So like HTML pages, um, X query code, um, <clears throat> CSS, uh, TI documents, the odd, and so on. So the exist database basically contains the entire application. There's nothing external to it. And the very first step when you load a web page in uh, your web browser is that exist will send the raw HTML to the browser. Um, there is already some processing applied there because exist does have its own HTML templating system. So some variables inside this HTML will already be replaced. So there are things only exist can know about the, the environment, yeah, like versions being used and, and so on. So this is already done on the exist side. Um, this is the bit you usually don't really need to change. So in older TI publisher versions, um, you were likely to change it, but in your publisher versions, it's no longer necessary. So you don't really need to learn that part. You can use it as is. So this will provide the raw HTML skeleton um, to the web browser. And in this HTML skeleton, there will be ordinary HTML, like for headings and uh, so on. But there will also be custom HTML elements like PB view, PB facsimile, and all those others we have seen. The browser, when it loads the page, it will also load some JavaScript libraries, which contain definitions for PB view and PB facsimile and so on. So it will evaluate those divisions and turn those custom HTML elements into active components, which can do something. So once the complete page is loaded, um, the first component, which kind of becomes active, is PB view, and it will try to load <clears throat> its content, so more HTML, uh, from exist by calling back to exist, calling the processing model implementation running on top of exist. So that's an API call. So PB view, sometimes you can see it. If it's loading a, a, a long uh, text fragment, you will see that the, the framework of the page is already there, but then it takes a second or so until the text actually appears. This is because PB view, like any other web component, is completely independent and works asynchronously. So it asynchronously requests um, to send the request to exist uh, to please render a certain fragment of TI into HTML. And when it gets it back, it displays it. So that's uh, step three. Uh, the exist will exist will return HTML after it has applied the ODD and the processing model to the TI. So next, there's another component on this page, PB facsimile. So PB facsimile, when it loads, it does not yet know what to display. So it's in kind of idle state, just waiting. And once PB view has loaded the entire text, it will find those PB fax link elements in the text. And this makes it send a signal to PB facsimile. So PB facsimile receives the signal. And in this signal, it has a list of facsimile images. Um, it then 
sends a request to the triple IF image server um, to actually get to grab that image data. And the triple IF server then sends back um, <coughs> images corresponding to the current zoom level and so on. Yeah, so that's the the basic control flow on, on, on this page. So we have like different layers. We have the exist layer, which is the, the backbone, the back end. And we have the web page. And within the web page, there's yet another layer, namely the web components, which have a life in their self. Yeah, so they are asynchronous, they are um yeah, they are they are they they are running on their own and just sending signals to other components. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on in such a page um, asynchronously. Okay. Um, so how does this plug into TI Publisher app? Oops, sorry. Um, well, so the iPublisher in itself is not a monolithic um, application, but its functionality is split into libraries. One very important library is the TI Publisher lib, the name already says it, which implements the TI processing model. So that's an X query library running on top of XSDB, which the Web components can call um, to retrieve an HTML rendition of a certain TI fragment or other XML fragment. Next to it, there's another library being used, the actual user interface components. Um, so they are not directly connected with the library or with TI Publisher itself. They are actually kept in their own um, JavaScript library, which is hosted on NPM. So NPM is like the, the global package service for, for um, JavaScript-based um, libraries. So those user interface components, um, they include all the, all the web components, all the basic building blocks we have just seen. Um, and you can replace this component on the fly. So um, if a new version of the user interface components is being released, um, you actually just need to change a variable and then this new version will be used. So all those, those two libraries, they are completely independent. You can replace them at any time with a newer version and your TI publisher or your generated app will still work. Um, so, because for your understanding, the other important uh, fact we will look at today is that um, while TI Publisher app is like the, the boilerplate app for um, your first steps with, with all ODD and templates and so on, at some point you will want to create a standalone edition out of what you did. And this standalone edition will just in the same way as TI Publisher itself, it will import those libraries where it gets its core functionality from. Okay, but we will look at this uh, later today. So just to summarize, uh, web components, they are provided as a separate library package via this NPM service. Um, they can also be used outside Publisher. Yeah? So um, the web components do not directly need to run on TI Publisher or on Exist even. They just need to be able to talk to an instance of TI Publisher or Exist running somewhere, but it doesn't matter where this somewhere is. Yeah? So it can be a, a different server in a different country um, the web components don't mind. So we can look at some, some examples of this kind of using uh, web components outside Publisher. So first of all, um, we, we have a bunch of examples. 
which are running as so-called code pens. So code pen is um, quite a popular website for yeah, doing drafts, uh, presenting little bits and pieces of code to people. And CodePen is running somewhere. I don't know where it runs. It might be in the US or in Europe. I have no idea. Um, but we do have a collection of little code pens here um, where you can always see like the HTML code and the CSS associated with it. And that's that's all the code needed to produce um, the output you see below. Yeah, so to, to create a web page uh, which displays Shakespeare's uh, Romeo and Juliet in, in the way you see it um, is here. So all the code needed is in this little window. Yeah, so we have 40 lines of HTML and we have some yeah, 35 lines of, of CSS and this produces exactly the output below. So CodePen is quite good if you just want to experiment with web components and learn a bit more about them. Um, we will see in a moment um, how this is connected with our own documentation. Then another possibility would be uh, to just use web components inside a website based on a completely different technology. Yeah. So we know that um, a lot of websites, they are not running like exist and so on. Yeah, it would be nice if they did, but yeah, they don't. A lot of websites are just based on things like PHP or Python or stuff like that, WordPress. Or it might be that your university is running some kind of content management system, which will also be based on some completely different technology, which is not compatible with TI Publisher or Exist. But you may still want to be able to embed a, a, a document, a TI document you were just working on into your, say, blog. Yeah? So I created uh, one example here, which is using Hugo. So Hugo is um, a static website generator. It's quite popular because it allows you to um, click together a website within minutes. Um, and if we go there, we can see, OK, I included. So this is, is my block entry. Um, I included some information about how I actually did it. But then I show that I can um, actually embed uh, here uh, Kant's Kritik der Reihen Vernunft um, <clears throat> with TI Publisher web components inside this block. Um, likewise, I can, can also do the same with uh, Romeo and Juliet, for sure, using a slightly different layout. And I can do the same with a facsimile. Yeah, so I have my IIIF uh, served facsimile embedded here into my block. So that's, 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 that's one way to do it. Um, it's just basically loading uh, this uh, web component library provided by TI Publisher, and then embedded, embedding some HTML into your page. So this page here is written in Markdown. It's not even HTML. Um, yeah, and we can do, do the same with other sites. <clears throat> like Andreas has prepared a WordPress site <clears throat> based on the same principle. Yeah, so this <clears throat> WordPress conventions are slightly slightly different. Um, I must say I don't know much about WordPress really, but you can see that it has the same effect. Yeah, you have to define some some fields within WordPress, and then you can also include uh, our cunt directly into this WordPress block. And uh, here's the same being done with the uh, facsimile view. Um, so this shows you some of the power of uh, web components and how you can also use them um, outside TI Publisher. Um, if you really would like to know, to look up all the different components which are available, I would suggest to have a look at our API documentation, which I linked here. 
So in fact, this is served from yet another server called unpackage.com. Um, this is basically where uh, the, say, compiled version of this library will be available and where um, TI Publisher loads it from when you when, when it inter in, imports the web components. Um, but also the API is running there, so you can have different versions. Yeah, at the moment we are looking at version 0.9.14.0. Uh, and here you have the documentation of all the different uh, components. Like if we look at the familiar PB view, you can see a description of the component and then every single attribute it accepts um, is uh, documented. Yeah, so it's called properties here, but in fact, um, those properties, they are attributes you can specify on the element. So for us XML guys uh, saying attribute is more familiar than saying property, you know? but uh, in JavaScript world, it's called a property. Uh, yeah, so you can see the various attributes uh, being defined here. And for each of those uh, API, um, documentation elements, you also have examples. So like if you click on view TI document, you see the already familiar display of Immanuel Kant. Um, some, some documentation items have multiple examples. Like here we also have example of a doc book document. This is, that's the TI publisher documentation. And if you would like to know what HTML is needed to display exactly this example, then you can just click, okay, in German code anzeigen or show code. Um, and this shows you the whole uh, code snippet used for the very uh, uh, example you see above. So there's not more to it. It's really that this example is done just in 28 lines of HTML. Plus, say you want to play around with this, okay, and see what happens if I mess it up, then you can always click on uh, edit code. And then this example will open up in a fresh code pen. So we already saw this code pen stuff before. Yeah? It's really for experimenting and playing around with things. So you can now go and uh, just modify something in here. So let's say what happens if we are just using a completely different ODD. So this would be like here. So let's say instead of using the docbook ODD, we are switching to DTA, which is uh, the ODD used for Kant. Well, it has an immediate effect, uh, even though not the desired one, because um, the output is messed up. That's expected because obviously the documentation is written in docbook, whereas um, the ODD for Deutsches Text Archiv, so that's the one used for the Kant, um, is based on TI. Yeah? So we have incom incompatible um, XML uh, languages being used here and the output is accordingly uh, screwed. So, but we could uh, also change this to, to another document and then uh, we would get an, an, an output again. So what could we use? Uh, let me just see if we, if we want to go for the cont again, then we can just, well, let's just change it to this and see what's happened. And takes a bit, but yeah, now you see, <coughs> we switch documentation uh, to cunt and it still works. Yeah, so in, in this environment, you can just play around with the different components and uh, yeah, also learn how to work with them. So we could also change the, the view type from division to page and wait a second. And then, yeah, we have a page by page view although also a bit uh, messed up now because the title 
is wrong. So, but we can, can continue that way, playing around with things, okay? And you can essentially do this with, with any um, element in this list, which have has uh, a demo. Yeah, so you can look at the single elements and what they do. There was this question, what does PB drawer do? Well, that's documented here. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there are other elements which are not even related to TI, like there's a markdown element, which allows you to display markdown content if you click on the demo. Yeah, so there are various components, and I would suggest to just uh, browse through them and see uh, what you want to play around with and, and try it out yourself. Okay. <laughs> So that's the bit about um, web components. Now, um, are there any questions with respect to this? No? OK, then let's continue with our second topic. So we created. Let's go to uh, the current state of things. So where we are right now, or should be right now, is we are working on this text. Uh, we have an odd, where is my odd here? And we have an HTML template. So current state of things is like this. Yeah, we have the metadata, we have the text of the document, the transcription, and we have facsimile to the right. And now we are at a point where it would actually be interesting to take this template together with the ODD we worked out and put everything into its own application. So users are no longer seeing um, yeah, all the, the, the environment of, of TI Publisher, but they get a custom view. And then we could also change things like the, the logo and maybe the fonts a bit, the colors, yeah, just adjust things to our liking. And then we will take this uh, finalized app, install it on our own server and publish it and make users happy out there because they can start reading our texts. So that's what we are going to do. Mm. So we want to generate a standalone application out of what we have done so far. A standalone application is basically a custom website generated out of TI Publisher. And it combines a certain ODD with a certain or one or more HTML templates which have been prepared plus web components and puts all this into a standalone edition which can be passed on to other people or installed on a on a server. Um, okay, so let's let's just do it. Um, when we are within TI Publisher, to generate a custom um, website, yeah, for sure we need to log in. So I will log in with the default user TI and password simple. Um, you can also use uh, TI demo demo. I think that should also work, but um, yeah, it's in this case I'm just telling you both. So either TI password simple or TI demo password demo. So I log in, and then I go to admin, app generator. And here I get a form uh, to fill out. So that's all the information needed for my app uh, to be generated. So first of all, I have to select um, the correct ODD, which in my case was this uh, ODD called Dodis Wolf. Then I have to give it a unique identifier. So this has to be a URL. 
Yeah, but this URL does not need to actually point anywhere or exist. So it, your fantasy is is free here to come up with anything you like. It's just that this URL should be unique. So it should be unlikely that anyone else on the world would also use this very same um, URL. So I will just do a quite simple XSDB org uh, apps. And then I call it, uh, yeah, just again, notice wolf. And I need a short name, uh, which will be used to identify this app um, up in the in the browser uh, URL. Yeah. So TI Publisher has the short name TI dash publisher. Um, so that's where this short name is used. And I will just call it uh, Doris uh, V. Um, then I have the possibility to um, specify a different um, data collection, but I'm happy with the default, which is that uh, my TI documents are expected to be in the data subfolder of my generated um, website. Then I have to uh, give it a title, mm, and I will just call it Wolfgang's Dodis. Then I need to select an HTML template. And for this, where is my template? Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Oh, it's somewhat hidden. Yes, it was hidden for me, sorry. So I select my template, Dodis Wolf, which I, which I created before last week. Then I have to specify what's going to be the default view. So here you can choose by division um, or by page. In our case, we don't have page breaks in the Dodis document, so we have to go by division. I can also specify where I want the full text indexes to be routed. So this could be either on division or on the whole text. And since our texts are rather small, it makes sense to create them on text. So this is just about um, the, the portion of the document which will uh, be searched if the user enters a, a query. Um, so for, for short texts, um, you can also choose the entire text as reference context. Um, for, for long documents, you want to use something below. So then we have to specify a user and a password. And yeah, I'm lazy, so I'm not going to create a completely new user. I will just reuse our TI user with password simple. If you create another user, then you need to remember the password um, because the app will be owned by this user. So for security reasons, it is recommended to create um, your own user here, but at the moment, I don't need that, and I can change it later. So I say save generate, and then let's hope that everything goes well. It takes a bit because it's shuffling files around, and my app has been generated. So if I click on open now, I get something which looks familiar. It looks like TI Publisher, but it's a separate app packaged uh, up with, with just the, the things I specified. We will have a look at what exactly an app package is at the end of this session. But for now, it's sufficient to know that um, this is no longer a TI Publisher app. You can also see it because uh, the URL has changed. So it doesn't say TI-Publisher, uh, but it says DOTISW, which is the name I chose, the short name. So this is a completely new environment now. It also does not have any documents yet because those are not copied. Um, so I can just start re-uploading my these documents here. 
So, and then I go into one of the documents. And you can see the output is just like um, I had it before. Okay, so the next step would be to customize this generated website. So it's look and feel does somehow differ from TI Publisher and it becomes a slight bit more sexy, say. You know? um, so we want to change things like the logo. There's still the TI Publisher logo there. I don't want to have that. I want something uh, <laughs> specific for my project. Um, I don't like the colors. I would like to have some nice background. Yeah, so I think because we are talking about uh, 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, yeah, our theming should somehow somehow um, adjust or match um, the, the the topic of our edition. Okay, excuse me a moment. I'm losing too much battery. Um, yeah, okay, now <sighs> plugged in. Oops, somehow everything is crashing. Okay, back. Um, yeah, so I want to ma the, the, the theme of this page to somewhat match um, the topic my edition is about. So, Berlin Wall. Um, okay. So we want to change the styling, um, change also the logo. Um, so first of all, if now we go into Excite, sorry, closing, closing this, and we are trying to open a file. We are not. We we don't want to look into TI Publisher as before, but actually we go to DB apps and there should now be a collection called DODISW. So that's here. And we go in there. If you look at the, the structure of this directory in more detail, you will notice that it mostly corresponds to the structure, the directory structure of TI Publisher itself. So what you are already familiar with is that uh, the templates, the page templates, there are in templates pages, and there I also have my Dodis Wolf. Okay. Um, so what I would like to do first now is uh, replace the logo. So for this, I need to upload my logo image. Um, so images always reside in resources images. So those are the static images. And I want to upload something there, but it's not possible via open document. Sorry. What I need to do is to go to file and then not open, but file manage. So, and here I have this upload button in the toolbar, which says upload files. So I click on that and then I go to upload files. I could also upload an entire directory, but I want to select some files. So I do upload files and I go to the workshop folder. So where I copied the stuff from, from GitHub to where I check this out from GitHub. And in there now you will find a folder called images. So I go to images and then I just mark them all because I will need them all and I upload them. So now you can see uh, three more files have been uploaded to this collection. That's fine. So now I need to reference them from within my HTML template. Okay, we know where the template is. We go to uh, templates, pages, and we know, so, so you see all the, all the different templates here, including like uh, Shakespeare and so on, um, because by default, the TI publisher just copies them all in case you want to reuse one of the others. 
Um, but I'm only interested in Dota Wolf, which is the only template being used at the moment by my app. So I double click to open. Then in here, I just need to find uh, where the logo is, is imported. And um, actually, it should be somewhere here in the header. But what I see is there's an include, which actually loads templates menu HTML. So that's the file where probably the logo is. OK, so then let's look at that menu.html. So where is it? Aha. Uh -huh. So here we have it. You can see it loads uh, resources, images, TI publisher, local contrast, and so on. So if about we just replace this with our logo, and I think it's uh, it's PNG or isn't it? Yes, PNG. And then we save. We go back to the generated page. Uh, where did I end up here? So reload. And well, there is sort of a logo up there, but it's kind of screwed. Um, this likely happens because there's some evil CSS which bends this logo, so so makes it fit into a certain space. Um, so next step would be to to change this in the CSS. Um, now it's important to know where to find uh, this this CSS, or actually, if you look at though this wolf, our still existing template, um, we can just check in the header where is the CSS loaded from. And what we see is there are three um, link uh, elements. The first seems to load something related to fonts. OK, so likely this is not where we want to change the logo size. The second one also does something with fonts. It loads this Os Oswald font from, from Google. Um, so that's likely also not what we want to change. But then the third one looks promising because this says um, theme.css. So let's have a look there and see if this uh, has definitions for a logo. Um, yeah, so the, 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 those CS, this CSS stuff might be a bit confusing now. Um, I will talk a bit more about it uh, later. Um, so looking at this CSS, people who have seen CSS before might be uh, a bit astonished because obviously this uh, has a lot of the, those uh, dash dash pp something blah blah uh, properties, which are not normal CSS properties. So what this is, um, this is a so-called CSS variable. So it's it's a list of variables which are defined um, and which will be reused elsewhere in the CSS. Why did we move all those variables here? Well, because it makes it much simpler to just change a particular uh, theme, um, a particular property. Um, however, for for the image, uh, we don't have anything in here as variable, so we just need to see where is this logo actually loaded from. And I will just search for logo. And uh -huh, so here there is something about logo. And here there's a logo image, so that's likely what we want to change. And you can also see that this defines a fixed width and fixed height. So that's the culprit. That's why our image looks so distorted, because obviously those numbers uh, are for the TI Publisher logo, not for our new logo. So we want to change this. How do we change it? Well, first of all, we could directly modify this theme CSS. But this is not recommended, because at a later point, you may want to update uh, your theme.css with uh, new features to incorporate new features which have been added to TI Publisher in the meanwhile. 
Um, so you want to make sure that later you can just overwrite this theme CSS with any new CSS being provided by, by um, TI Publisher. So it's best to just create an, a new empty uh, custom theme.css and overwrite things there. Yeah, so I will just copy this bit because I want to overwrite this. And then I create a new CSS file by clicking on new. And I say CSS and create. And then I have a completely empty one. And I paste in this rule about the logo. And I change the width and the height to auto. Yeah, I don't want, I don't need fixed size there. And the rest can stay as is. So I click on save. And I need to give this a different name. So I will just call it custom theme.css and save. And now the last missing bit is that I need to import this into my template as well. So I can just copy this element where it imports theme.css, paste it in and say custom theme CSS. So back to our page and reload. And you can see now we already have a nice uh, different logo, logo up there. So next step, um, yeah, what else would we like to do? Um, oh yeah, so we would also like to change um, this, this blue and light blue uh, background. And we want to have something more specific to the topic of our edition, which would be Berlin Wall. So I, in, in the images, I included this um, well, snippet, which has been taken out of a, a real picture of the Berlin Wall. It's just a small snippet, but it shows this kind of concrete uh, wall. And I would like to use that as a background. Um, so go back to Excite and uh, into our theme CSS. And what I would actually like is to override something which uh, is called like header. Ah, oh, there it is, PB header background image. So this sounds very much like it's the right place to uh, do something. So I'm going to copy this into my custom theme. And now uh, this can just go into the body rule. Yeah, so it's in, in the body rule here as well. So I just copy this and I'm going to use my other image and load it with URL. And what's the name of my image? Uh, where is it? Uh, BG header. So. BG header .jpeg. Uh, But by the way, you can see that Excite is showing you this uh, warning uh, with a red uh, cross to the left. You can simply ignore that. It's just because um, CSS variables have only been introduced, uh, I don't know, two, three years ago into major browsers and uh, Excite still sticks to the old CSS syntax. So I, it thinks this is invalid, but it's not. So just ignore it for the time being um, that it warns you. Um, looking back into theme CSS to see if there's anything else we need to change. Yeah, like we have some background colors here, obviously, which might intervene. So I think I also need to change this background color because you cannot have um, both. And um, well, you, if you fill the, the an HTML element with a color entirely, then it will completely cover what, what's behind. So we need to, um, well, let's switch it to none. And then just save. 
and go back and reload. Okay, and it doesn't find the image, it seems. Um, so why? Yes, because it has to be a relative path. Um, so relative from the location where the CSS currently is. So the CSS is in folder resources CSS, um, whereas our image is in resources images. So now it should work. Going back and reload. And you can see we now have proper background um, image applied. OK, so we could do more here, but um, we'll, we'll leave this as a homework. Um, yeah, so let's just move to, to Another topic, namely, we also want to extend our site with some static content. So pages which are not um, part of the, um, of the corpus we are editing, but which are just like an about page or a page of links or other auxiliary, auxiliary um, pages. So how about we just add an about page? And there would be multiple possibilities to do so. So you could just add a plain HTML page, or you could even you reuse um, the PB Markdown web component to write it in Markdown. Some people, for some people, that's much easier. Or you could just use XML. So you could write your about page in TI XML, and then just render it in the same way as we render other pages. So let's do that. Um, we go back to the start page. Oh, and there's another thing here. Uh, you can see that uh, here the logo is still the old and the background is still the old. Um, so we now the background should actually change. Why doesn't it? Um, no, guess, ah, because we have not import. Well, let's just quickly do that. Uh, so we changed all this wolf and imported our custom theme. And let's also do that for the start page, just as repetition. Let's include custom theme, CSS, and then we also had to change the logo, and here obviously the logo is somewhere else. Oh yeah, it's here. So we'll just change it here as well to logo PNG. Oh. So that's the index HTML page, which is loaded if you are not uh, viewing a particular document. So let's see if this has uh, helped. And yes, now we also have this page um, according to our uh, editions uh, style. So, but what we actually wanted to do was to create this about page. Uh, sorry for getting distracted. Um, so we will just upload an about page. I already prepared one within the workshop GitHub uh, and it's in data and it's called about.xml. So just like other TI documents, we are going to upload this. And voila, there it already um, appears. Uh, if we click on it, well, then it's it's being displayed. Um, well, it's using kind of the wrong CSS. Why is that so? Uh, mm, well, I can't say for the moment, so let's ignore this. We'd have to check. Um, but what we actually want to do is to link this about the project from our, our menu. So we know that we are on the index HTML page. And let's see where, where the menu entries are. 
da, da, da. So here we have class menu bar, and then here's the logo. And just below the logo, we can integrate a link to our about.xml. Reload, yeah, we have this about link, click on it, and there it is. So going back to start. Um, so now, now the only problem is that we also have this about the project listed um, in our main uh, document view, which is not so nice, uh, because here obviously we only want to have the actual volumes um, of our edition, the actual texts of our edition. So we need to somehow tell TI Publisher to execute this one document, which is not difficult. Uh, so we are just uh, going to the main configuration. And I think we looked at it before. So there's this one file called uh, config.xqm in uh, modules, which has a lot of configuration parameters applying to your um, to your application. So we open that. And in here, we also have a parameter, which is uh, something with exclude. So here, data exclude. So here, we can actually provide a list so of XPath expressions referencing documents we don't want to have included. And we already have this taxonomy XML in there. And we are, we are just adding another one. So let's put parentheses around it. So we can have a list. And then I'll just copy this, comma, and I add our about.xml. And then that should do. So save, go back, reload. And now it's gone. So our about uh, page is being uh, ignored, not shown on the list in the list of documents. Okay. Um, yeah. So coming to to the last topic, we need to talk a bit more about styling because we covered one aspect now in this session, which is the theme.css or custom theme.css, which I created, which governs the overall look at and feel of this uh, of this site. However, um, the web components themselves, they are, um, well, they have their own life, yeah? So they only adopt to some extent to the overall styling. So there needs to be a second part which deals with how texts are actually being displayed. So I think I have a slide for that. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, so for a custom application, we need to keep in mind that um, the styling is determined by two um, factors or two levels. We have the overall styling of the site, which is done in theme CSS or custom theme CSS, if I overwrite it. So this would contain all the, the general typography of, of the page, um, the colors being used, um, the, the margins between different blocks and stuff like this. And as we saw, it also contains a large number of CSS variables to control um, various uh, factors, yeah, which also need to be styled. Like it had variables for the default primary color being used for the uh, secondary color and so on. But there are also variables which have an influence on how the web components are displaying things. Like if you remember for um, for the names of people, so person name, we had this pop-up, which uh, displays um, yeah, more information about that particular person. 
And this pop-up is a web component, yeah, but it defines uh, various default styles. So you can have it with uh, light, uh, white text on dark background or dark text on a light background or with a border, with a shadow, and so on. Um, so those are things which you can also control via CSS variables to some extent. No, not everything, but simple things like this, you can switch via variables. So that's one half of the story, the overall styling of the site. So this is where you would create um, the, the design or the theme um, to cut to govern uh, all of your website. But then there are the texts themselves rendered via PB view. And um, those are, as I said, encapsulated. Yeah, so there are those little monadic entities which are not connected to what's around them, which means that also their styling is um, not influenced by what's around them. They come with their own styling and they won't let you um, influence or change their styling just from the outside. So we have this other aspect of styling, which is controlled via the ODD. Yeah, so we already did that. I mean, we used output rendition in the ODD to set particular CSS properties on uh, certain elements of the site. There's also another method, which would be to, instead of using output rendition, um, reference an external style sheet, which will be linked to the ODD. So that's uh, the recommended way to do it. There are also other ways, but in any case, styles being applied in this ODD controlled environment, they will only apply within the ODD. But let's just uh, change things a bit uh, to see how it's done. So in our, uh, in a document, let's go to one of the documents again. Um, yeah, so we have this orange color for purse name. Yeah, and at the moment, this orange color is defined within the output rendition um, of our uh, rule for, for purse name. So if we go to the, the ODD, so I go to, we already know this, I go to admin, edit ODD. And I look at purse name. Then you can see that down here we have this output rendition which defines color orange. So this is nice and fine. It obviously works, but it does have some disadvantages, namely that we are using a fixed color here, which may not conform to the overall color theme of the website or, or so, yeah. So it would be better to define this color somewhere else. However, we cannot do it in, in our theme.css because that's only responsible for the, the website as a, as a whole, and but it does not have an influence on how the ODT rendered content is being styled. So let's say we want to get rid of this and instead we want to define um, a CSS class. You can see for purse name, there is this field here in the graphical editor for a CSS class. In the XML, it's also, so if you prefer to edit the odd in XML, there's also an attribute called CSS class. And we just give it a CSS class purse name and we are going to remove this output rendition, which does color orange, okay? And instead, we are defining <clears throat> an external CSS style sheet. 
So we can need to we need to link this style sheet to our ODD, which we can do up here. So let's say we come up with our another. Um, well, how do we know, call it? Custom odd CSS. Well, or yeah, just custom odd CSS. So, and then now we we need to we can we need to create the CSS. So once again, we go to Excite. This is also still has to be done manually. So we go to Excite and as before, click on New uh, Type CSS. Create the CSS and then we just re-add the single rule for class CSS class first name, and we wanna have it color. Yeah, instead of orange, we are doing purple. Okay, and then we do save. And now it's just important that the CSS has to live in the same folder as the ODD um, it is linked to. So we save it to, in a generated app, all the ODDs, they live in resources ODD. Um, there we can see our .odd, so we just save it there. Uh, what did we say, custom, custom odd.css, I think, or what was it? Custom odd.css. So we're saving it, and now we need to go back because in order to activate this, we have to save the ODD because, in fact, this external CSS file will be linked statically with, with the ODD. So you cannot just change it and then expect that it is automatically applied. You need to resave the ODD file. So we save it and we go back to our app, reload the page, and we can see that all our people changed from orange to purple. Okay, so we could style further things that way, but that's then also for, for homework. Um, and as uh, one of the last things for today, oh no, I need to quickly explain something still. Okay, I need to explain something about this. Why do we have those different um, layers of styling? Yeah? Because you may still ask yourself, why is this the case? So the reason is that um, in the web components standard, there's this, for some it's a nice thing, for some it's a curse, but there is this feature called shadow DOM. So you don't need to understand all, all the details of it, but basically what shadow DOM uh, says is that um, styles in general so styles in a web component do only apply inside this web component. They are not influenced by what is outside. The reason why this was done is because web designers, when they work on, on, on pages traditionally, they have a problem or quite often encounter a problem which is called style pollution. And you just don't want to have style pollution. What does it mean? It means that if you want to display, say, two texts, like on the right, we have Kritik der Rein Vernunft, and next to it, we have the TI Publisher documentation. Okay, I agree this is not a very realistic example, but there might be other cases when you want to uh, view documents side by side, and they will use a slightly different styling because, yeah, they are from different epochs or, um, they just need different styles because the TI is different and the odd is different. So what style pollution means is that usually if you um, change styles in here and by coincidence they have 
they address the same HTML elements as styles in your other text, um, then kind of the styles used here will pollute the styles used there, and the last style wins and stuff like this. So there, there's a mess um, being produced by this style pollution. And basically, um, Shadow DOM and web components prevent this. Yeah, so all styles are neatly encapsulated. So our Immanuel Kant, in terms of style, will never talk to the TI publisher documentation. He does not even know about it. So that's the, uh, the benefit of Shadow DOM. The disadvantage is that, yeah, styles are only valid for this one uh, PB view in this case for this document, um, not for the rest of the page. And that's why we need to have those two different layers of styling applied, one for the general web page and one for um, the PB views showing actual TI content. However, yeah, there are exceptions. So some properties in CSS standard are inherited. This includes things like fonts, but also CSS variables. And that's another reason why we have this long list of CSS variables um, in theme.css, because variables are always um, inherited across the DOM tree. So they will also be visible to Immanuel Kant. Um, OK, so far, so good. Uh, now we are at a point where actually we do have all the basic building blocks for creating our own edition. OK, some work remains to be done to make it consistent and so on. But this is for homework. Um, but all in all, we do have the basic building blocks ready. So what we now would like to do is to take this um, website. And at the moment, it's running on my local laptop. OK, so apart from you, at this point, nobody can see it. Nobody can access it. So I would like to share this with other people. And I could either share it by passing it on to colleagues, say, on a USB stick or sending an email. Or I may want to share it and by putting it on a server and share it with the world. How do I do that? Well, it's the, the easiest way is to just look at the, the, the menu, because there will be, in the admin menu, there will be an option which says download app as XAR. And if I click on this, I'm getting something. I'm getting a file called dodisw.xar. So what is a XAR file? This is something I quickly need to explain. Um, within the XSDB context, yeah, so XSD is, as you know, an XML database, but uh, you can also run server-side code on it. So until a few years ago, the problem always was that OK, I, create, I, I stored my TI documents in Exist. I, stored, I wrote some, some queries. I wrote some HTML and some CSS. Yeah. And then I wanted to pass this to someone else. But yeah, things were like uh, some bits were here, some bits were there. So it was rather complicated until at, I don't know when it was exactly, but I think 2000. 12 or so, or 11, no, 12, um, someone came up, up with an actual standard. So that's the EXPATH packaging standard, which basically describes um, a, a directory structure with certain descriptors and so on. And the idea was that you can create a zip file out of out of uh, this directory when if it follows this structure and you can pass it to someone else and that person can install it into their exist and it will work as it did for you um, originally this was intended to work across 
XML databases and also across XML query engines, including uh, engines like Saxon and so on. Um, but it turned out that the differences, yeah, are are too large. Yeah, so certain certain libraries you can distribute across uh, systems; others you can't. But nevertheless, the, this XAR format is still um, the central format being used within Xys to distribute um, applications and libraries. And in fact, if we now go to the XSDB dashboard, yes, I'm not sure if you have seen the XSDB dashboard before. So when, when, when you start Xsist for the first time, you will likely see um, like this kind of display, so the, those little icons. And each of those icons corresponds to one um, application or one SAR which has been installed. So you have Excite is one, the XSDB documentation is one, um, but TI Publisher is another one. And surprise, we now have even my Wolfgang Stodis added to this dashboard. Why? Because when I clicked on generate, um, TI Publisher did actually generate a compatible XSDB application package and installed it in the package manager, in the dashboard. So I can always click on this and um, I will get back to my, to my app. Um, but I could also now just, just to demonstrate it, um, I'll go to package manager and for, for the moment, I will just uninstall this to show you that I can re-upload it. Now I re-uninstalled the app, I try to load it and it says document not found, that's expected. And now let's assume um, I'm not myself anymore, but a colleague, yeah, and I received this, this w.xr. Um, and I just want to install it into my exist. So I can click on upload, uh, navigate to the XR and click and it installs. It takes a bit. So now we are done. I can go to the launcher and there's my Wolfgang Stodis again and I click on it. And again, there's my app. So exactly the same would happen now if you wanted to um, install this XAR on a, on a web server, on your university server or somewhere. If you have an exist running there, all you need to do is upload this XAR and then it will go live and be available there. Um, because this has been asked as well as last topic, I could also, so this dodiswxr is nothing else but a zip file. And I could also just um, unzip this file into a doc directory. And then inside this directory, I do git init, yeah, because I want to have it in, in GitHub or somewhere, and I can do git init and uh, push it to, to my GitHub make changes, push those changes and so on. And then later, if I again need to build this XAR because I need, I, um, I need to reinstall it somewhere, then I can just call build and, and it will regenerate the XAR. So maybe let's have a quick look at this uh, in practice. It will only take a minute. Yeah, so say, We have this XR downloaded. Um, so I can just create a new directory. And uh, oh, how will I call it? So uh, this workshop. And I switch into it. So, and then I can unzip the XR I downloaded. So 
repo and now i have exactly the same structure on my in this directory as i had before um, inside my database um, so now let's let's assume that i commit this to github and i even make some changes locally and so on but at some point i want to reinstall this into another database or i want to um, pass it to someone else so all i need to do at this point is to call um, a build script this build.xml and that's actually using a build system called ant which is a java based system um, the links where where you can install this um, i have in the in the um, workshop assignments for this week so, but just so you get the idea, all I need to do if I want to create a new version of this app is to call ant. And you can see that this builds me another of those XOR files and puts them into uh, the build directory. Um, and then I can install this through the dashboard as I did previously. Yeah? Um, so only caveat in this case is uh, when TI Publisher generates the XOR, it will remove the user's password. So if you chose a different uh, user password, then you need to re-add it, which you can do by editing uh, repo.xml. So here you see permissions, user TI, group TI, and the password is missing, so you need to re-add it. So I will just write password simple. That was the one we used before. That's the only thing you need to do. Um, why is that? Well, because obviously it's it's a security risk. Um, if if someone manages to get to get on your website and manages to download the XOR and knows that in there there is the password, then that's that's a risky thing. So we delete the password before generating the XOR. Um, that's the only the only thing to do. And then you can do ONT again, and it will produce you the XOR. And yeah. So yeah, that's uh, it for today. Um, let me find my screen again. Any questions? I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Um, namely, um, if I want to dynamically change the the rendering of the the XML, how would I best go about that? Uh, so, like for example, I have text with some abbreviations, and in the XML there is abbreviation mark and expansion, and I want by default to show it the one way, but there to be an HTML component where the user can click to, to change to the other view. Uh, I sort of assumed that I would use multiple ODDs that inherit from one ODD, and then I switch dynamically between those, but apparently an application only takes one ODD, so that wouldn't work. So now I, I don't know how to do that. OK, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, yeah, so there are multiple, multiple ways to do it. Um, you already mentioned having multiple ODDs. In some projects, we actually do that and use multiple ODDs because the differences between the ODDs are substantial. Um, however, ODDs can also inherit from each other. Um, so it's possible to have one ODD for, say, a diplomatic view and one for a normalized view, which extends the one for diplomatic. But in most cases, this is not, not needed. So there's a simpler possibility I hope I have shared my screen again. If we go to the Web Components API and then to uh, PB, where is it? Uh, PB select, PB toggle feature, for example. Um, 
this has three demos and they basically do what what you just asked yeah so i have i have and, and there are two different options there's an op the option to do it with a round trip to the server so have the odd distinguish different states this is what we are doing here so if i switch off diplomatic view um it it switches to normalized view um, as you can see, all the line breaks are gone and uh, abbreviations are expanded and stuff like this. So it switches multiple parameters. Um, I can also have plain reading view, then everything, well, then it's like normalized view, but also all the highlighting is, is dropped to make it easier to read. So this is done with a server round trip. Um, and if we look at the code, then you can actually see, um, no, where is it, where is it, where is it, uh, moment is this, yeah, so then, then you can see how it's defined here, so I simply have, uh, parameters corresponding to e.g. diplomatic view. In this case, uh, my parameter is called mode, and if it's switched on, then it it will uh, get the the value diplomatic. If it's off, then it will get the value norm. And this parameter is available within the odd. So within the odd, I can ask um, is mode currently diplomatic or is it norm? However, I can also do the same thing client side. So that's the second example. Um, it uses the same text, um, also has a normalized view. And the only difference here is that actually it should do it. Ah, no. <laughs> okay. So it does it all client side. So there is no server round trip and it's, it's slightly faster for sure. Um, so both, both approaches are possible. Yeah, so there are at least those three um, possibilities. Um, the third being that you actually have two different odds. So we have we have one example um, in this uh, SSRQ project. They are actually using two different odds, one for normalized and one for diplomatic view. Yo, okay. Hope this answered the question. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so if not, then uh, yeah, this is our our last uh, session, but it does not mean that the workshop is over. Yeah. Um, so as before on GitHub, you will find some assignments for for this week, and um, again, I will upload um, a video explaining how to um, solve the assignments um, next Monday. And you are still uh, invited to continue to use um, to use the Slack channel uh, mm -hmm. to ask questions even after this workshop has ended next Monday. And yes, there will certainly be um, other other workshops, other possibilities uh, to continue. Um, yeah, so as I said, don't stop. Um, TI Publisher basically it needs some it needs some practice to learn um, how the different wheels and components and so on fit together. But once you are more familiar with it, um, it will also allow you to get up and running um, with 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 new data, new projects. Um, in a very short time. So we can do new projects within just a couple of days. 
and get quite far in that time uh, because it's always the same. If you learned it one time for one edition, then doing the next edition is much simpler because it's always the same patterns we use and apply. Okay, yeah, so hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, just continue and uh, don't hesitate to ask questions in Slack um, or elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye then.